everyone, and thank you for being back uh, at this heroic time <laughs> after <laughs> rushing to, to lunch and after all the excitement from the first panel. So I'm Paula Barreiro Lopez, and we are actually attacking the third panel, uh, Culture as Weapons of Liberation and Solidarity, that, as you can read on the handout, aims to redefine the meaning of weapons in partisan struggles reintegrating the radical sense that those, those cultural expressions had and play. And I'm accompa accompanied by three great speakers, uh, Mariano Mesman, who will be online with us, and I hope he's there already, Sanjuta Suderanson and uh, Mohamed Jacoubi. And so thank you very much for uh, wanting to, to, to start a discussion with me uh, today. So after uh, the session of yesterday's session, where we return to the figure of the partisan on his and her historical dimension, but actual possible iterations and difficulties of in today's days. Um, this morning, we were actually debating different cultural projects connected in different ways with the partisan legacy. So we turn now to the power of artistic, visual, and cultural production through history, or histories in plural, I would say, and a space to think about the agency of art and visual culture for building solidarity and be part of the liberation that the partisans fight for. So visual productions were a founding element in coordinating causes, objectives, full and the struggle, creating collective imagination, hopes and desires, dissenting genealogies, as well as transmitting revolutionary memories. It was clear by today's talk. And so our session will have a long, spatial and chronological span from the 30s to the 60s, 70s and today, addressing artistic and cultural interconnections between Cuba and Italy, in the case of Mariano, Palestine, Palestine and Bangladesh, in the case of Sanjukta, Japan and Palestine, in the case of Muhammad, uh, Mohana, sorry, and well, different places of the Atlantic, as you will see through the lens in my paper, uh, and practices of artists, filmmakers, and militants. And so the different talks will take a detailed look to mediums, different mediums and modes, modes of production, putting the visual on the center of our analysis, and thinking and helping us, hopefully, to think how partisan cultures operated and how they challenge traditional ways of understanding art. And so I think also the session will be bring, uh, bringing back questions that we discussed in the last days, especially the question of the archive, Jihan, because uh, somehow I think the talks are dealing with uh, archival work, difficult archival work, and maybe we can construct this counter archive and think how it can be reactivated in Benjamin terms. So my talk is mostly an introduction, so I will stop now and I will present to you uh, the speakers. Uh, so Mariano Mesman, who ta will talk after me, is head research at the National Council of uh, Scientific Re Research, um, University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. And he's a specialist in third cinema um, and the connections between uh, Latin America and the third world cinema. Uh, he actually, and something that is very specific to his analysis, he puts together a reflection on uh, cinematographic practices, but also visual and artistic practices, and so he, he has uh, several books on the 1968 moment. And then uh, Sanjuta Suderason uh, is uh, right now a senior assistant professor at the D Department of History of Art at the University of Amsterdam, and she works extensively in modern art, left-wing aesthetics and intellectual histories of colonization, and she actually wrote a wonderful book that is super relevant to our uh, session today, of course, Partisan Aesthetics, Modern Art and India, India's Long Decolonization. And uh, Mohana Jakubi is a filmmaker, producer, and one of the founders of Ramallah-based production house Idiom Films. And he also is a founder of uh, the research and curatorial collective Subversive Films. And he fo focuses, uh, as you can imagine, imagine, in militant film practices. Okay, so I will, <laughs> I don't have to present myself, I was already, and so I will pass immediately, just let me find, my presentation in order to have it on hand. Ready? So this is my, my talk. We are partisans. 
building a cultural front in a globalizing context. In 1961, the French journal Partisan published in its first issue a manifest by Bercourt declaring, we are partisans. The journal established a clear connection between the partisan struggle against Nazi forces during the 1930s and activism in favor of the Algerian revolution on both French and Algerian soil. Their claims rehabilitated the struggle as a revolutionary one, bringing as well a program of decolonization that was rooted in the internationalist ambitions of communism, but updated to the revolutionary impulse of the South. The extension of the anti-fascist struggle from the 30s to the 1960s was not just acknowledged by leftist French intelligentsia, but became part of the DNA of an anti-colonial and anti-fascist left that was starting to organize on global scale. Partisanship became identified with resistance against fascism, but also imperialism in small groups, mostly hidden in the forests and the mountains, eventually also in the cities in the 60s and 70s, showing that guerrilla tactics like sabotage, ambushes, or raids could have a decisive e impact on fighting the traditionally organized larger and military superior and organized troops of the enemy. Within this new partisan front, being fooled by the struggles in places like Algeria, Cuba, Vietnam, and Palestine, cultural practices took a determinant role. Already in the 1930s, artists, designers, photographs, choreographers, as we saw, had increasingly joined the partisan ranks to take a stand against fascism. And throughout the Cold War, creative minds enlisted in internationalist movements that aim like their predecessor at constructing a culture that could encompass the radical rupture embodied by the partisans. So from the anti-fascist movements of the 1930s, through the anti-colonial and anti-imperial momentum of the 60s and 70s, in a progression that is not linear, not perfect, that has these moments of conscious reactivation uh, in multiple place, places and spaces, this talk traces a particular lineage of images and creative practices throughout Atlantic partisan geographies that together configure what we can call a cultural partisan front. So I am assuming, okay, very clearly, the heterogeneity of partisan practices and movements that I will present to you today, liberation struggles, emancipatory uh, movements, but I am consciously taking the risk of a panoramic approach, uh, chronological and geographical, to address the validity of the three concepts that give title to this session, weapons, liberation, and solidarity. So my intention is to underline lines of connection between movements and practices that even if dispersed in multiple places and times, they saw themselves under a shared genealogy and utopian and revolutionary horizon despite their differences. So I will encourage you to use the time of debate if you want to discuss in more detail uh, some examples that I will show because we will see a lot of things. So I'll start with weapons. So. Pablo Picasso famous statement of the years of France occupation during World War II that a painting was much more than a decoration and had to be understood, I quote, as an instrument of war, attack and defense against the enemy was following a logic clearly connected to his experience with the Spanish Civil War, where multiple artists had nourished the Republican front as, uh, <coughs> as artists and contributed great, greatly to the social organization, but also to the equation of the siege republic with their works. Its cultural dynamism visible in the multiplication of posters, guerrilla theaters, and war dance spectacles on the streets, along with journals, as you can see, and even cultural militias in charge of uh, literacy campaigns was punctuated with a collective and internationalist reflection and organization that re-signify the work of artists, writers, dancers, musicians, and intellectuals as active, as, as active part of the struggle, sorry. So a great part of them, they took actually new positions in government, as Joseph Renau as uh, director of fine arts on the Republican front. And so they understood their productions as necessary tools to win the war. 
cultural productions equated with weapons was a com convincingly reaffirmed in the visual and sophisticated apparatus constructed during the war, but also in diplomatic endeavors that the government, the Spanish uh, Republican government, took, uh, for example, the Spanish Pavilion in 1937 International Exhibition in Paris, a propaganda action to present culture in its multiple derivation as the bulwark of resistance to fascism, and to which Picasso and his famous Guernica, hmm, and also other avant-garde artists like Jean Miro uh, contributed. So, Picasso's statement that you see here was consciously readapted to the partisan context of the 1960s, and here the quotation is in the catalogue of the 1967 French May Salon that took place in Cuba. This is a moment that mobilized artists in large scale within what was called a cultural guerrilla front that reaffirmed, at least in Hispanic countries, a terminological shift from partisan to guerrilla uh, uh, as, a ta uh, as a military tactic that was actually used a lot by partisan that actually Carl Smith, as uh, uh, Gal showed us yesterday, was already acknowledging uh, this uh, in his theory of the partisan. So, forged via multiple debates and encounters of internationalist and tricontinentalist spirit, like the Cultural Congress of Habana, the concept of cultural guerrilla brought together many practitioners at the center of a conscious strategy for conducting a counter-offensive against the capitalist, imperialist, and colonial so social system, while assuming the legacy of the battles and the demands of the anti-fascist front since the Spanish Civil War, and this is how uh, it was actually interpreted, at least by the Western participants. So aiming for the reunion of all forces of the left, the notion of the guerrilla elaborated during the 1960s, as it was in the case of the partisans in the 1930s, as Gal showed us, was much broader than a military tactic, including the intellectual and the cultural realm. And for example, here you can see the, uh, the, the connection between painting and guerrilla, or for example, as Julio Lepac was thinking about uh, how can we build a cultural and artistic uh, guerrilla. So, and as the artist, the painter Roberto Mata, put it in front of the delegates of the Cultural Congress of Havana, the idea was to fight from the very individual practices of everyday life to make a kind of individual guerrilla in the fields of all human experience in order to eradicate the bases that sustain imperialism. And actually, 10 years later, in the case of the exhibition uh, in solidarity with Palestine in Beirut, he expanded on this idea and he said, if the military has to use force, a cultural front should open your mind. I believe the main purpose of a cultural front is to unite people all over the world. So, multiple artists, film directors engaged in the cultural guerrilla front, collaborating in the creation of his visual arsenal. And in this context, the configuration of a new status of for work of art as bearers of uh, valu value equivalent uh, to actual physical guerrilla weapons was explicitly reaffirmed. So the artist as a combatant with his own instruments had been constantly emphasized during the 1960s, and one of the leitmotifs of the years of the Vietnam War was that the painting of protest is worth a grenade or a rifle. And so during his visit, his visit to Cuba in 1967, uh, the cartoonist Solon Steinberg depicted this idea with this funny way, uh, the artist fighting with his paintbrush, while other caricatures interchange the role between the artist and the guerrillero, and the guerrillero and the artist in a kind of Maoist uh, iconography. And so this correspondence can be found in multiple places around the world, as the Atelier Populaire à, à Paris, à l'École Normale Nationale Supérieure des Beaux-Arts, during May 68, uh, that were very clear about the belligerent role of their production, mostly poster, but not just. So, openly renouncing to define its productions in terms of their visual character and aesthetic value, but instead by their function and political effectiveness. And in this sense, they said, and I quote, uh, they consider the posters as weapons in the service of the struggle whose rightful place was in the center of the conflict. That is to say, they said, in the streets on the walls of the factories, end of quote. So their posters created collectively and anonymously with artists but also militants without artistic training left the gallery to take part in the struggle on the streets like other objects of the revolt, like the cobblestones, 
of the Rue Saint-Michel, the barricades, and also the Molotov cocktails. So, and this it can be visible in other contexts. For example, the case of Chile, where the cultural work was well firmly established as key instrument of the struggle. Here you have the Brigadas Pictoricas, a partisan collective pictorial practice strongly developed since the 1960s and emerging from the communist youth, so that they asserted this vision clearly. So consciously reaffirming themselves as brigades, huh? a term that had clearly anti-fascist uh, connotations and traditions, they acted in rapid actions of collective painting of walls to convey the Unidad Popular program, greatly contributed with their paintbrush to the very real fight for visibility and counter-information during the conflicted electoral campaign of 1960s that gave the victory to Allende. My second point, liberation. So, partisan movements inscribed their actions within a revolutionary social transformation that was well aware of the polyedral dimensions of their struggle, considering the implementation of a revolutionary culture as part of their transformative endeavor. In this sense, during the 1930s, the anti-fascist armed militias were not only fighting for land and freedom, we know that already, but also for liberation. And this is interesting, Renau in Paris in 1937 does have this photo montage in which he, sh he shows how the Republic and the anti-fascist uh, movement was actually helping to liberate women, to bring them, to, to put them into uh, an active role. And you have... Uh, uh, here, the contraposition between the old the traditional woman and the new miliciana. No? This is something that other leftist movements later on understood and cherished. And for example, Tony Negri explains that in the Italy in the 1960s, I quote, 70s, sorry, we began to understand how the freedom won in the fight against fascism and the German occupation had been achieved by men who share our feelings who didn't just fight against something, but rather fought for a new world, one that they wanted to seize by making, experiencing, constituting, and creating it." End of quote. So, in the case of the Spanish Civil War, these parties and cultures spread up, down, and up, up, with governmental organizations as well as independent ones that shared the common goal of winning the world, but also transforming the Spanish society. And in fact, as they explained in the press of the time, during the war, the fight was for bread, but also for knowledge, at the reach of everyone, for a more just distribution, not only of material goods, but also of food for the spirit." End of quote. So, being partisan implied to imagine new configurations of the social, building in the urgencies of the struggle new cultural structures, educational organizations, and understandings of what culture was and for whom it was destined. Opposing fascism, partisans was as well opposed bourgeois culture, undertaking the extraordinary effort of building a new cultural aesthetics and social space for and with the people who until then had been excluded from and by culture. Something that was at the core of the revolutionary ambition since the 1930s, but continued on the 40s, 70s, 70s, 80s in revolutionary projects. So the production of art, theater, and dance on the streets in the cities of the Republican Front in Spain or in the hidden forests uh, or liberated zones in, uh, by partisans in Yugoslavia, shared the same urgency of replacing the bourgeois culture with a popular one, a desire that underpinned emancipatory projects of different kind over the 60s and 70s, making of the popular a place of revolutionary action. The popular became a leitmotif that would be reinterpreted and instrumentalized, of course, too, in multiple contexts and decades to come. So the reconfiguration of cultural practices as a collaborative endeavor that should declass the bourgeois limits, limits of cultural organization was underlined in partisan and revolutionary movements along the 20th century. And I give you an example from the Portuguese anti-fascist movement in exile in Grenoble, where I come from, actually. So, um, for example, in a letter of intentions, an exile of Portuguese militant anti-fascist group explained to its member in December 1973 their collective initiative of a proletarian calendar, handmade 
obviously with non-professional and industrial results, just opposing cartoons, slogans, photographs in a composition specific for each month. The calendar was offered to the members of the journal El Hablambre as an instrumental way for building the proletarian culture that was at the core of the struggle against the Portuguese uh, dictatorship. And so the, qu the, the letter said, uh, I quote, what is the proletarian calendar? It is a calendar that seeks to make known the historical dates and the struggles that will remain in the history of our class. The bourgeoisie wants to put it into our heads that history was what they made, but this is not true. So, end of quote. So this clear, simple, and clever explanation encapsulates the main aim of the Promethean part partisan cultural program, fighting at the same time for a nationalist world, the end of the Portuguese dictatorship, but also an internationalist one, the end of bourgeois society. They build culture in their own terms, setting and fixing moments, images in time in which the proletarians, the wretched of the earth, were the subjects of history. And the calendar considers culture as an expression of creativity to which everybody has a right and which everybody could participate actively. It was done uh, collectively. And what is very interesting is that you can see in multiple places how it was necessary to take in hand the mains of artistic and visual production in order to actually be able to produce silk screens, for example, and this, this is the case of the Portuguese anti-fascist movement, but the very famous, no, uh, the, the poster workshops in the 1960s and 70s. So this idea fueled partisan projects since World War II, finding in art, music, cinema, and group, uh, a ground of, for expression, fight, and resistance. So a collective production multiplied in partisan projects, the class in the boundaries between amateur and profession, professional production, indicating uh, the entrance of the masses in the field of creation at the same time as in the field of history. Here, a painting, a collective painting done by artists and non artists in, in Cuba. In opposing fascism, colonialism, or imperialism, artists built a partisan counter visuality that simultaneously affronted bourgeois culture, and here the exhibition of the Third World uh, in, in Cuba during the C Cultural Congress, and reconfigure, more importantly, the representation and the visual codes of the oppressed as empowered and collective active groups taking control of their future. So embedded in the revolutionary program, a new visual imagery was shaped in which popular and propagandistic ambitions met the experimental language of the avant-garde, which often mix uh, multiple media and a lot of photomontage. This is from the Tri Continental uh, magazine. And in this sense, if we take go back to the Chilean brigades, they actually embodied such hybrid character oscillating between high and low cu culture, between professional and amateur painting, incorporating avant-garde languages within a figurative representation, and this is clear how they incorporate the pop art uh, cultures, for example. The Brigadas uh, sought to establish a proletarian painting, and they say it in a beautiful way, un arte sin cuello sin corbata, uh, a painting without color and tie, also distancing themselves from the Soviet orthodoxy of social realism. So my third point, solidarity. Bringing together militants, intellectuals, and artists within the partisan cultural project was key to build intersectoral, uh, intersectoral solidarity between different social sectors, nationalities, and classes. A shared condition between workers, but also of internationalist scope was a key part of the partisan anti-fascist cultural front within the communist vocabula vocabulary. So this model expanded from the 60s to the 70s to in revolutionary geographies, generating a concept and a specific concept of solidarity to the liberation struggles, which was associated with mutual collaboration and tactical support within the national liberation movements. However, it went beyond material aid, defining a type of collaboration that included the exchange of knowledge, human material, uh, also share uh, models of organization, and also visual training, as it was the case, for example, uh, Cuba uh, took on several uh, militants and, and guerrilleros to, to train, but also Almicar Cabaral sent also to Cuba people to, to be uh, trained into filming uh, practices. No? 
So from this perspective, solidarity was shaped as a transnational movement, internationalist in principle, linked to the need of sharing resources and net in the struggle uh, for liberation, in which the visual representation and codification had a key importance. The three continental built an effective visual apparatus through film, photography, especially um, a lot of poster production that integrated the struggles of three continents, creating an imaginary community that connected revolutions around the world. A similar a strategy that other anti-fascist movements follow, for example, the Portuguese. And although these three continents and solidarity seem located in a specific geopolitical space, uh, the third world in arms, as we can see in the logo, the concept from the beginning was understood from a deterritorializing de perspective, understanding solidarity from a delocalized collective uh, perspective that could include all minorities in the north and the south beyond their specific race. So, this geographical interconnection of the struggles was consciously and necessarily visually forged, and sometimes uh, it, it masked actually the tensions that existed in the movement. So this is, uh, we have to say that. Um, on the one hand, it is visible in the journal Tricontinental, the use of photography and geography is very interesting, a lot of maps in this, in this journal. It was crucial to create a world map reconstructed and custom made, building for the reader a revolutionary geography to hold on. And on the other, the partisan graphics materialized the important affective element of interhuman collaboration and the creation of subjectivity that the concept of solidarity included by multiplying images of trans-race collaboration, but also distributing and circulating, and this is very important, posters that could be collected touched and appropriated. You know, the three continental had always posters that you could uh, pin in your, in your wall if you wanted, you know. Uh, so, sharing the symbolic models of interracial fraternity in different moments of the 1960s, and this is quite interesting, this is Siné in 1962 and Rosgard in 1968, they coincide in the visualization of the struggles interconnection that the term solidarity implied. In the cartoon of 1962, Siné depicts the partisan spirit as a battle of races in of the world in a connected struggle, sharing a common goal, an ideological basis that could overcome multiple difference was a ba basic trait of the partisans. So in Sinez cartoon, this sense of brotherhood was represented with the interconnections of years and her of the racialized fighters, establishing in a premonitory way, yeah, this is quite interesting, the basic visual identification of the future tricontinental project. So this poster, um, the poster of the three continents, they will reinforce this idea, very clear in this one of Rostwar, um, Rosgard. The male silhouettes representing the three continents holding a Kalashnikov were interchangeable, composite. These images with different iterations exemplifies the collective horizon that the three continental engender through a pop language to gestate a model that surpassed the actual space being reused in other places around the world. And for example, here is a poster uh, uh, produced at the uh, um, Paris Sorbonne 1968. So it is very common to use to find uh, strategies of commonality uh, that, that, that are developed continuously. For example, this is Lazaro Obreu, Activian artist for the Tricontinental, and Emery Douglas for the, from the Black Panther, and they are sharing the same uh, motives. Also, how they build and configurate genealogies of other struggles of resistance and emancipation, and this is uh, in a very sophisticated way, but also, for example, the, the our Portuguese uh, anti-fascist partisans that were actually all the time building this kind of genealogy from the communal, like uh, Gallo was talking yesterday. And also they were actually um, reinforcing the collective participation of men, women and children uh, that, this, uh, that is visible in this production. And so while it's true that the universalist male model took a, dealing ro a leading role in the revolutionary iconography the, since the 30s, and so you have the 30s until the Black Panthers, <coughs> Uh, partisan productions offer a place for contribute configuring an intersectional images of combatants through uh, also the reconfigurations of the uh, image of and role of women 
uh, in the struggle uh, that it was very important to succeed. It couldn't happen, you know, so without the, the participation of women. And this is not from the Atlantic, but it, it uh, is um, a poster done by Claude Lassalle in support of Palestine, but uses the same idea of the woman uh, as fighter and also mother that we can see uh, iterations around the world, but also children, uh, children as agents of, of a struggle. This is something that we can see in, in different places too. So in fact, this graphic builds a visual continuum through iconographic iterations, graphic work was key to visual codification and subjectivization in order to foster alliances and create a shared horizon. And in this sense, the aesthetics of solidarity of partisan art are not based on friend enemy model, and yet they participate in the transformation of subjectivity and self perception where the roles of militancy are reconstructed. And so I'm going to conclude. I hope I'm okay with time. Okay. Good. So. The lines of contact that nourish the affiliations between the anti-fascist movements of the Second World War and anti-imperialism and anti-colonialist politics that the new partisans uh, promoted made it possible to establish a partisan genealogy which, as Traverso and so Traverso explains, was fundamental in mobilizing left-wing cultures around the struggle for the future. And this is why the iconographical models and moments acted as a visual commons that different movements of the world make use for their own causes. However, with the collapse of communism and the epistemological turn that resignified the comprehension of the 20th century from the century of revolution to the century of victims and violence, the process that deactivated the revolutionary and emancipatory memory determined a disappearance of uh, partisan memory in a lot of places. Its history stayed scattered and disconnected, mainly, mainly forgotten, with their archives perishing and disintegrated, as we saw today. But as before Berardi affirms, even in defeat and retreat, such movements are the bearers of possibility that is not yet completely extinct. And it's interesting to see how uh, with the demise of global capitalism from 2008 in multiple places, artists and activists had been going back to the partisan archives in order to reactivate traces, actions and documents, recuperating their scattered memories for the present while situating them firmly within their historical context recognizing the key contribution that cultural production and performative collaboration had for generating constituent power. And this is the thing that is interesting how, when this is uh, Black Lives Matter, how they're actually reactualizing some of these uh, uh, motives and um, visual uh, codifications. And I wanted to put this one. So this recuperation of such conflicted and hidden memory has a new potential in today's social, cultural and political movements. As in the words of David Craven, they help us to think in alternative ways and thus to imagine the world anew, encouraging to break with the mental landscape imposed by established hierarchies of power, and of quote, and also they remind us of the strong ties of transnational collaboration, affectivity and identification that are today so desperately we need desperately to repair and to build. And I wanted to finish with actually this, how uh, the Tricontinental Institute for Social Ref Research is actually taking this poster of this Cuban artist, um, René Medeiros, 1969, and retransforming it and actually uh, taking the weapons uh, uh, and, and putting the books, you know, uh, like uh, uh, as Vijay told us uh, yesterday, you know, this resignification of this, uh, these uh, struggles in the past, but happening also via this visual continuum. Uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> so we will have all the talks together and we will have a moment to discuss later on. So I will pass right now Mariano. Uh, we should be in connection with Mariano Messman. Is, is the third? Ah, okay, what? sorry. It, it is the third. Okay, so it's, so it's Sanjuta. I, I, I thought that it was Mariano. Okay, okay, so bring Mariano. 
Okay, bring Mariano. If, if <laughs> I think it gonna, it's gonna work well. Okay. Hello, Mariano. Hi, how are you? Fine, very happy to have you here. So I was thinking that, sorry, I, I was thinking all the time that you will be after me because there will be a lot of parallels, I suppose. Don't, so. worry, don't worry, it's the same for me. <laughs> okay. Good, so the Do floor you is... Hear me? Yes? Do you hear me? Okay. So uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thanks for the invitation. Uh, let me tell you that uh, my my English is not very good, but I think I will say what I want to say, uh, and you you will understand me. Um, this talk, I'm sorry, I need to share my PowerPoint. Here it is. Okay, so this talk is based on my research about the um, 1968 Italian film Idanati della Terra by Valentino Orsini and Alberto Filippi, uh, which is a political film about the liberation struggle in Guinea Bissau against Portuguese colonialism and also about the European commitment to the Third World. This film was part of, a, of the configuration of a cultural and cinematic third world trend during the 1960s in Italy and beyond. Owing to the fact that the filmmakers of Idanati de la Terra participate at the Cultural Congress of Havana in January 1968, I will present here some questions around the film linked with the discussions during the Cultural Congress. I will focus my talk on three topics. You, you have it here. Um, the creative convergence of a third world discourse with the experimental avant-garde trends of the time, the divergence and discussions about how to use the image and legacy of Che Guevara in political films. Finally, the way in which Idanati de la Terra, this film, links the African anti-colonial struggles with the legacy of the Italian partisan resistance. Idanati de la Terra is a, is a testimonial fiction film that tells the story of a leftist filmmaker trained by the Italian Communist Party. This filmmaker, Fausto Morelli is his name, faces the challenge of finishing a film about the liberation struggles on an African country by building on documentary footage that uh, he uh, in inherited following the death of his student and friend, the young African Abramo Malonga. Set as a film within a film, the film narrative core is set in the present and revolves around the daily work of Fausto and the dilemmas he faces while trying to finish his African friend's film without betraying his thinking. I will not analyze here the film, of course, but we can say that it includes uh, three parts. The African part, around the tensions and, and contrast between the peaceful struggle for independence and the army revolution in Africa, the Italian part, about the European intellectual and artist commitment to the third world struggles and especially the role of the Italian Communist Party during, during the Cold War. And the last part, um, the, the labyrinth of violence, which introduced a radical narrative rupture as we will see soon. So I will return to the film in a moment. But let me tell you before that in those years, the directors of the film, uh, here you, you have them, Valentino Orsini and Alberto Filippi, were ex-communists looking for third worldist political orientations that they found, of course, at the Cultural Congress of Havana in January 1968. 
The Congress, as we know, was one of the great uh, attempts to articulate an international cultural partisan community. More than six, uh, 600 artists and intellectuals from over 60 countries arrived at the Congress to discuss the situation of colonialists and neo-colonialists in the Third World. At the same time, the Congress followed the impulse, we can say, of the Tricontinental Conference of January 1968 and others political and cultural meetings held also in Havana during 1967. Uh, Paula wrote about them a lot. On the political level, the, Orsini, uh, uh, the affinities uh, of Orsini and Filippi with the third uh, worldist orientation promoted by the Cuban government during the Congress were evident to such an extent that in a book chapter on the Congress, Rebecca Gordon Nesbitt compares Fidel Castro's closing speech about the reformist positions of the European left during the period with Alberto Filippi, one of the directors of the film, talk during the meeting a talk during the meeting where he criticizes the left European parties and intellectuals because they are passive commitment with Vietnam. Also, the film has a key episode about this topic that I cannot uh, explain here. No? So, but I would like to highlight a, a second example of the Italian filmmakers' affinity with the Cultural Congress that allow us to delve into some current discussions about the Cuban meeting. The Cultural Congress has been preceded by a preparatory seminar with national Cuban delegates only. The final resolution of the media commission of that seminar proposed for cinema the promotion of the cultural vanguard movements and the independence creators and their activities through film magazines or cinematics, as well as the filming of army struggles of the liberation movements. Both activities were being account for by the filmmakers of the Italian film. The critical interventions in festivals and magazines on the one hand, and the filming of the Guinean fighters against Portuguese colonialists on the other. As we can read in this resolution, I'm sorry, here I am. As we can read in this resolution, the cultural worker, uh, that is the intellectual, would have a contribution to carry out the liberation struggles for, from his, her professional practice, in this case, the cinema. Of course, he, she would, so, would do so within the framework of the revolution, but without necessarily subordinating his, his her action to other higher spheres, such as the military one. However, as, as is known, the positions on the role of the intellectual, their involvement in armed struggles, etc., were part of a strong debate during the Cultural Congress. In this sense, the today's interpretations about the Cuban meeting are divergent. In recent years, some academic studies assume very critical views on the Congress. They spoke of a rejection of artistic avant-garde, of proposal of Sovietization, for example, or practice of, con of control and, and censorship. These critics somehow consider that this, in, in some cases, that this was anticipating later ev ev events during the so-called Quinquenio Gris. I don't know how to say it in English, great Quinquenio, maybe. Um, okay. Although all this is still part of controversies, from my point of view, it may be appropriate to think of the 1968 year in Cuba in its complexity, or as a year divided in two, as Claudia Hillman argues, with the first half marked by the climax of the euphoric uh, alliance between the intellectuals and the revolution, and a second half, the beginning of the dissolution of those ties. 
This distinction is operative, I think, to think about the January Congress, to recover its bold and avant-garde commitment in both the political and cultural level. That is what I'm going to refer uh, to, to refer to now based on two key cultural manifestations around the meeting. The Cuban Film Institute, I'm sorry, the Cuban Film Institute director, Alfredo Guevara, and its Cuban newsreel director, Santiago Álvarez, both played a significant role during the Congress. This bold filmmaker, Santiago Álvarez, connect in his documentaries the experiment of film language with internationalist struggles, Vietnam, Latin America, black power, we know. This connection was also expressed, expressed in his almost unknown newsreel about the Cultural Congress. This short film is an, a, we can say, ingenious a combination of visual and sound representation that results along, along with work sequence from the session of the Congress, of course, to many image of the, of the flourishing Cuban graphic and visual culture, especially to the third world exhibition that Paula spoke about. This was the most ambitious uh, cultural intervention inaugurated as part of the Congress, as Maria Berrios and Jacob Jacobsen show. Its radical and an original proposal arose from a collective interdisciplinary work and consists of an avant-garde uh, mass initiative. I was, uh, I'm sorry, it was designed with a kind of multi multimedia strategy organized in, a, in areas, almost in barriers, I would say, that took advantage of the modern and monumental structure of the Cuba pavilion to display a series of objects and striking image. The design had been uh, sought in order to alter, of course, the museum tradition while being careful not to fall into the simple uh, pamphlet, we can say. The main idea was to build a sequence of environments that show the brutal uh, reality of the third world in which the viewer would travel in order to involve him uh, or her in the search for revolutionary response to colonialism and neocolonialism. Many international artists who visit the third world exhibition highlight its design, the sound work, the graphic and photographic montage as well as the dialogue with the pop and mass culture. Sam spoke uh, of cultural guerrilla and more than one remember Mayakovsky. As I mentioned, Santiago Alvarez, the, the filmmaker, used many, of, uh, many images of the exhibition in his newsreel, integrating them into montage of visual and sound impact on the viewer, a shock effect effect, I'm sorry, that the exhibition itself also looked for. So both, both cultural initiatives around the meeting share the combination of experimental proposal, proposals with the necessary, we can say, communicability of the Cultural Congress anti-imperialist message. The filmmakers of Idanati de la Terra were also in tune with this. I would like to, <coughs> I'm sorry. I would like to show now why I say that they were in the same, with the same ideas. Uh, first, I would like to remember the resolution of another uh, commission of the preparatory seminar of the Congress where they need to risk on the aesthetic level through search and experimentation was postulated. The, the idea of to risk and to invent cinematic forms was a concept also promoted by Valentino Orsini in those days. In his presentation at the Cultural Congress, he said that he was aware that cinema cannot replace, cannot replace politics because 
it was not a weapon nor a party. But he proposed making films that become project of a revolutionary opposition. He reflected on both cinematic language, <coughs> I'm sorry, and the ideological, the ideological basis of his ongoing film. He spoke of breaking the traditional schemes uh, of the spectacle in order to display an ideological happening through which explore the open ideological hypothesis of the film, of Idanati de la Terra, the film who, who, who we, uh, the film which uh, he was doing at, at the time. Orsini's thought mainly, mainly addresses to the last part of the film I mentioned at the beginning. Now I show the, the three parts, so I'm going to speak about the last part. Um, as a whole, the labyrinth, refer, the labyrinth of violence refers to colonial violence in the third world. Prison and torture are the aspect that, that were more present in the original script but unlike the realistic depictions of other films, in the labyrinth, they get a more abstract form, we can say. At the same time, from the beginning, Fausto, the, the filmmaker, the main character of the film, speaks to the camera, thus breaking the previous structure of the story. In, in this way, the labyrinth scenes represent violence or incorporate it as a method. Coldly scenes that symbolize uh, the domination suffered by persons stripped of their human condition, which, refer, which is referred uh, to by the complete nudity of the actor's bodies, for example. These scenes resort to mechanisms of happenings, participatory art, and other manifestations that concern the vit vitality of gestural and body expression. The, lab the labyrinth consists of a minimalist staging stripped down almost empty uh, all white rooms with disturbing, with, with disturbing sounds in which men are lined up uh, like prisoners along the walls or, or jump from their feet face down in torture. Other sequence depict helpless women uh, trying to, to escape from bombing, from bombings or napalm flames uh, that constitute a Dante's hell. Okay, at the end of the, of the labyrinth, the voiceover interrupt the film with a direct challenge to the viewer that you can read it here. So, but in this interruption, Orsini and Filippi propose an open end for the film and invite the audience to go out and face the violence of the system which exists beyond the film, outside the institution of cinema. Questioning the viewer, and encourage, I, I'm going to my, my second point. Questioning the viewer and encouraging them uh, to take part in the political process is a common, common characteristic of many militant films of the period, as we know. One well-known example is the Argentinian third cinema documentary, The Hour of the Furnaces, uh, La Hora de los Hornos by Fernando Solana San Octavio Getino. Even though the Cultural Congress took place at a moment of grief and pain following the then very recent assassination of Che Guevara, of course, a feeling for a challenge uh, to respond to his legacy provided or, or, or at least was promoted. My point is to compare how both films, the Argentinian Laura de los Hornos and the Italian Idanati de la Terra, respond to this challenge and how they depict, they depict it on the screen. 
The end of the first part of La Hora de los Hornos is famous. It includes a TV image of the corpse and the face of Che Guevara challenging the viewer with his gaze. Uh, the voiceover uh, narrates the, the voiceover that a, a, accompanies those images is constructed around a solemn discourse on guerrilla heroes, heroes, uh, heroism. Uh, you can read it here. This is the discourse of the voiceover of the film while we see the different image of the corpse of Che. This ending has a strong impact in the forums of the world political cinema as a symbol of revolution, as we know. However, Cuban cinema authorities reject this use of Che Guevara dead body, both for political and emotional reasons. Indeed, in 1969, Alfredo Guevara suggests to Solanas that the image of Che of Ted Corpse be removed for the Cuban screening of the film of Laura de los Hornos. The scene about the Che Guevara in Idanati de la Terra was filmed, was filmed by Orsini and Filippi when they returned to Rome from the Cultural Congress. During the meeting, Alfredo Guevara, uh, I remember he, he was the, the main uh, figure of the, of the Cuban Cultural Institute, uh, its director. Alfredo Guevara also expressed, expressed them uh, to Filippi and Orsini deep objections of the use in their film of that image of the corpse, but also of the youth of the use of any image of Che. So the, tra the treatment of the fall of Che in the Italian film was so different, briefly. In one key scene of the labyrinth, an aggressive accusatory voice voiceover interrogates a Latin American woman, Margaret, and accuses and accuses her of lacking of lacking commitment during the chest death. Where was she when it happened? She never looked for desserts. Did he, Margaret? Asked the interrogator. I wonder, I ask you, didn't you kill Che too? Behind the Barrentos rifle was not only the United States, but also your indifference. The situation becomes increasing, increasingly uh, aggressive while the, boy, while the voice emphasizes her lack of mercy towards Che, telling her that no one believes her anymore, not even the spectator, but an, exhaust, an exhausted Margaret in a gesture of resistance exclaimed, that's enough. Visually minimalist, with no image other than those of Margaret under the violence of the off-screen cruel interrogation, the impact of this scene perhaps was less powerful than the impact generated by the image of Che Corps in the hour of the furnaces in the La Hora de los Hornos, the Argentinian film. In any case, I think the challenge to the audience was not less radical. In both films, the scenes promote a kind of guilt that, as Che would have done, incites the viewer to action. If I have three minutes more, I, I can read my, my last point, it's okay. Okay. Sí, Mariano, tienes tres minutos. Okay. So my last point. In the last years, some scholars studied the configuration of a counter aesthetic associated with third world struggles during the 1960s from books and films by European intellectuals who had previously collaborated with the resistance uh, during the Second World War and later incorporated its legacy in their 1960 works, films or writings. For example, Nicolas Mirzoev or Nilam Srivastava studied that bond mainly around films and writings on the Algerian war. In the configuration 
uh, of what uh, they, they studied that in, um, around the configuration of what Mirzoev called uh, the colonial counter visuality and Srivastava called aesthetic of resistance. In her case, associated to the Italian third worldism, where she includes the study of Idanati de la Terra, the film I, I, I'm working on now. In this way, I would like to highlight the peculiarity of Idanati de la Terra. Uh, not only it's a film about the African liberation struggles made by, by an Italian filmmaker who participated in the Italian resistance. I mean, Valentino Orsini uh, was in prison and was part of a militia partisan group, no? But more important, I think, is that the film's plot, its story, explore and discuss that bond. I mean, it is the story, as we saw, of a filmmaker, Fausto, who also participated in the Italian resistance, who then make a film, the film within the film, about the African liberation struggles. So in the, in the midst of the daily work on, the, on his film, this, uh, this filmmaker of the film, Fausto, recalls a journey he and Abramo took to his native Pisa in order to meet all party comrades he had dissociated from due to political reasons some years earlier. The main scene focuses on a tense discussion between Fausto and Yoyelo, whom the script describes as a former partisan, Yoyelo, a former partisan labor leader, I'm sorry, representing Fausto's ears in the clandestine struggles against fascism. In their conversation, Fausto shows his resentment toward Yoyelo for having accepted the Italian Communist Party's line after the war and for having defended a party that was a to, 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 say, say, that was told by events instead of directing them. As a result of his early criticism of the party's attitude, Fausto has felt uh, is isolated and even repudiated by his Pisa comrades. But the scene also exposes Yoyelo's political bitterness toward Fausto, who had abandoned Fausto, uh, he abandoned Gioiello and the other comrades by going to Rome to work in films. Abramo, Abramo's intervention uh, seems to, to lighten uh, the mood and despite their difference, a sense of affection and all friendships prevails. That is a political affectivity forged by their shared experience during the resistance to fascism and in, in the immediate post-war period. So, in fact, the Pisa episode culminates in warm uh, farewell hugs, hooks, I'm sorry, between the former partisans and Abramo as a way of symbolizing the affective and political bond of the anti-fascist past with the present of African independence struggles. Okay, I finish here. Um, here you have a photograph of the directors of the film and, and the journalist Romano Leda uh, with the militia in Guinea-Bissau. They, the, uh, they did an interview with Amilcar Cabral also. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Mariano. Keep, keep uh, posted and we will back, come back after the other talks uh, for a discussion. And so, um, Sanjuta, I invite you to, to the table and maybe I leave you my, my space here. You need it. <laughs> yeah, you need it, of course. Yeah. Can I move this? this no, I don't think you I need to put this, eh? Yes. Um, let's see. It's okay if I leave this here? Yeah.
Yeah, it's clean. You know, that one thing they did. It's okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Is this working? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Paula um, Gal, for uh, inviting me. Uh, this has been a most uh, fulfilling panel so far. I've been thinking along. Um, so in this paper, I'm focusing on a set of drawings made by an East Pakistani Bangladeshi artist, Zainul Abedin, in 1970, as he traveled through the United Arab Republic, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. Uh, this opening image in Bengali, it's written, Commandos Crossing the Jordan River. Um, I just thought I would begin with that. Um, in the summer of 1970, Abidin is visiting multiple sites of the Al-Fatah, the Palestinian the National Liberation Movement, including Palestinian refugee camps in Jordan, and drawing more than 70, perhaps even close to 100 sketches, depicting the life and struggles of the camp's residents. While some are held by the artist's family and the Bangladesh National Museum, many are now lost. My work with this set of images has three interconnected intentions. First, what this journey and the associated works mean for Abidin's own trajectory. Second, how this set of works, made in the spirit of transnational and transregional solidarity, speak to locational and regional experiences, in this case of East Pakistan. And third, how Abidin, as an artist, a pedagogue, uh, an articulator of an aesthetic consciousness for uh, uh, of in, in, the, in the unique transitional context of uh, decolonizing East Pakistan, which would become Bangladesh, Bangladesh of now, how he articulates a dialogue between the locational and the trans, uh, the transnational, the transregional, the particular and the universal. A larger question running through this presentation and indeed in resonance with what we have been talking about since yesterday, culture as a weapon of liberation and solidarity, uh, art, as, art and as partisanship is, how did artists from decolonizing contexts of the 20th century participate in or intervene in plural contesting notions of or struggles for liberation? To push the question further towards the more simplistic formulation, why think art to think liberation? It is worthwhile to note here at the stage where I'm coming from, as far as this body of material that I'll discuss today is concerned. I'm in the early stages of beginning a larger and certainly far more slower work towards thinking through how visual art practices in the 20th century, during 20th century decolonization, shaped new configurations and questions of the transnational or the transregional. And I'm coming to this domain or scale of the trans from my more rooted locational work so far with the vernacular archives of 20th century left-wing aesthetics in India. In what I framed as partisan aesthetics in my recent book, I have worked so far with the way in which socialist aesthetics and modern art practices entangled in mid-20th century India, in pre- and post-partition Bengal in the eastern frontiers of India, during and beyond the critical conjunctural period of the 1940s that was marked by a man-made wartime famine that happened in 1943, killing and displacing millions, and the displacements this famine and eventually the partition would bring about in the region and would parallel the arrival of independence. So the contradiction of independence and displacement is quite inbuilt into the trajectory. Partisan aesthetics, as I proposed in the book, is a potential way of reading how art and politics, in my case, left-wing politics, entangled in incomplete, contradictory, dialectical ways. Also in showing forms that are tentative, tentative unstable, and uh, also at times strategic, how artists become protagonists in that uh, entanglement. Um, I do not know why I'm not speaking from my book today. Um, I think um, th there is a, I think it's exciting to start a new work and in a, in a new context think along. So a lot of what I will say today is thinking along. But it is true that I ended the book, the, the, the epilogue of the book uh, was towards an aesthetics of decolonization, which was a way to think about how the category of or the framework of partisan aesthetics can be taken from the locational context, very rooted vernacular histories to the scale of the trans. Uh, the scale of the transregional, the transitional, the transnational space, and what can we do with this concept as we work with 
trans-regional archive. So in that sense, I'm delighted to see uh, inputs from uh, uh, Latin American, Atlantic, Eastern European contexts um, here. My talking about Zainul Abedin is also organically connected to the book, though it is still outside it. Abedin was not only one of the key artists who drew the famine of uh, 1943, you have Abedin's uh, sketches of the famine from 43, him uh, publishing um, or in the organ of the Communist Party, People's War, um, and the artist who is writing on Abedin is the artist I have worked on in the book, who was a card-holding member of the Communist Party and who documented famine extensively. So Abedin, Abedin was sort of inside and outside the Communist Party, which to me was quite foundational in shaping what the partisan would mean. Um, but being a Muslim artist, Abedin was forced to migrate to what became East Pakistan in 1947, as India was partitioned. India became independent, Pakistan arrived, became independent. Over the 1950s and 60s, Abedin became a key artist, artist bureaucrat, an artist diplomat, even an art pedagogue, and a national artist in the newly forming, uh, formed Bangladesh in 1971. Since 1950s, he had also be become a key figure in a particular kind of cultural diplomacy. He would work with the Pakistani government and on behalf of the government travel all over. Uh, he would go to uh, the United States. The moment he goes to the United States, the Soviet Union would invite him. Uh, then he would travel extensively within Europe and of course he traveled to the, the, the Middle East, which is the context within which um, uh, this paper is located. There is thus, on one hand, uh, a larger context of art and displacement within the regional and uh, or uh, national or subcontinental context of uh, South Asia in Abedin's work. And then on the other, his own very international uh, travel and works of solidarity. So in him, there is this double presence of the contextual and the transnational, which is the space that I'm also trying to uh, grapple with really conceptually. Um, wait, where am I? <laughs> Sorry. As I try to work through this wider idiomatic and ideological tra uh, traffic between the particular and the universal that I began with, there are two larger questions that maybe we can uh, think through collectively as the panel progresses. One is, uh, what can or would the methodology of moving between the particular and the universal be? And second, what conceptualization of the modalities of the transnational or the transregional can we draw thereby, and why? What would theorizing connections do, beyond showing, that is, that peoples, idioms, and movements are connected? What do we do beyond that? Abedin's trip of three months was organized by the government of Pakistan at the invitation of the Arab League. The trip happens in the larger context of the Arab League inviting artists, intellectuals, activists, and filmmakers across the world to Jordan to witness the Palestinian refugee camps. The Pakistan Air Force had participated in 1967 and 73 in the Arab-Israeli wars with Pakistani pilots flying Syrian and Jordanian planes. In East Pakistan, the dominant party, the Awami League, uh, supported the liberation movement of al fatah I'm, I'm, I'm quoting. Representatives of the al fatah were in Dhaka were known to, and I quote, adroitly selecting for trips to the Middle East those figures in high culture best equipped to transmit images of their nationalism into the East Bengali psyche. East Bengali here connotes East Pakistani because it was, East Pakistan was created out of dividing Bengal province in British India. In 1973, the newly formed Bangladesh would support the Palestinians' war against Israel in the Yom Kippur War. Soon after, in 1974, Yasser Arafat would meet the new Prime Minister, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman of Bangladesh in Lahore in Pakistan in the second summit of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. In the two months extensive tour of the Arab world, Abedin would visit the United Arab Re uh, uh, Republic, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. In the Express article in a, 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 a newspaper based in Dhaka, you see the correspondent writes, and I quote, although he had to spare some time to meet the painters and top brass in Cairo, Amman, Damascus, and Beirut, Still, at his first opportunity, he visited the commando camps in the Arab, along the Arab-Israeli front. His brush gathered a unique force. He drew as many sketches as he could on the real-life guerrillas, the fighters of the liberation movement sworn to fight till death to gain freedom for the vanquished Arab land. The great artist of famine of 1943 could not possibly overlook the shocking plight of the Palestinian refugees. 
if we go very quickly to just to give you a sense of what kind of images we are talking about, we have this very abstract, almost automatic uh, drawing of refugees that you can see that he did in the heat of the moment, almost like sketchbooks. And these are from his sketchbook that his son uh, has shared with me. Uh, this is the opening image that I kind of began with, not structured lines, uh, very automatic. And then there are slightly more crystallized images of the guerrilla figure. And then there are, uh, this is also in the same, huh? so refugees crossing the river, um, guerrilla fighters um, on, on the ground, and you have some of Abidin's uh, notes. So this is, has, there is a very potent archival quality to these images. Huh? So they are just stacked up, and Jihan, you are talking about, they're just there. I mean, his son is very friendly, he shares things a lot, so uh, we have this. And then you have some profiles, uh, profiles that would kind of, you know, this is quite an iconic image, uh, and it echoes very much, so those of us who are familiar with his 1940s work, of the image of the Madonna that he did in 1943, the Madonna, the starved mother carrying the child. Huh? So it's very much within the artist's own oeuvre, there is this fluid kind of citational quality to, um, to the work he's uh, doing. Um, I, of course, do not read Arabic, and I've just started this work, so I asked my colleagues in the Middle Eastern Studies Department to quickly decipher for me what's going on. And they said that here, Abedin is being received by uh, members of the al Bath. Uh, so th I, I imagine it is the al Bath newspaper, and they are tied to the Ba'ath party, so there is a clearly a socialist wider, including the Arab League, context within which Abedin is moving. And his own relation vis-a-vis -vis the Communist Party of Undivided India becomes quite active because he is, an, he is not a card-holding member, but he's an artist outside the party fold who not only supports the party but gives refuge to artists who are kicked out of art schools because of their co connections to the Communist Party. So he has this kind of uh, uh, role. So you have here um, some of the images reproduced uh, in the... Um, in the, in, the, in the newspapers in the region. Now, around this uh, body of works, around this body of works, I want to make three connected arguments. The first is tied to what these works meant for Abedin's own trajectory. A recurring association around Abedin's works has been one tied to his famine works, as you, as you saw already. Abedin had made hundreds of sketches of the famine of 1943 in wartime Calcutta, pressed by time and resource on cheap wrapping paper, brown paper. That is where he made his... Uh, the pressure of the situation he recalls to an interviewer forced him to change his style into stark expressionistic idiom, and I quote, in very easy yet strong lines in somewhat geometric patterns. Once Abedin migrated to the eastern wing of the newly formed Pakistan in 1947, carved out of partitioning the province of Bengal, the famine works not only went with him, but remained with him as a key artistic consciousness around art, ruptures, and humanism at large. Time and again, these would be exhibited, not only within the country and the region, but across the increasingly international trips that Abedin would make as representative of the Pakistan government. From his exhibition under the broader rubric of Art in India and Pakistan exhibition at the Royal Academy in London in 1948, to his Commonwealth tours of the 50s and 60s across Europe, the United States, Japan, Soviet Union in the 50s and 60s, Abedin's famine works would mark him. At each site, however, a different discursive reading accompanied these works, as well as him as a post-colonial artist. In the Western contexts when he traveled, for instance, he became not only the representative of the post-colonial artist, but also inescapably oriental. Even the most ardent of his admirers noted that he combined in his art, and I quote, the contemplative temperament of the oriental artist, of, a, of an oriental, with the quick journalistic observation of a European. Even to his famine drawings displayed at the Burlington House, which is the site of the Royal Academy in London, for instance, the critic and close associate of Abedin, Eric Newton, who in the early 60s was the director of the Commonwealth Institute. Eric Newton commented, and I quote, it is as though the oriental hand holding the brush in the traditional oriental way had been guided by the European eye, close quote. This rhetoric of oriental art remained a vivid category and appreciation of post-colonial artists in the metropolitan sites. Their modernism, their modernity even, never allowed in the same place as that of the West and displayed only within the wider bracket of oriental art. 
Abidin's works displayed in the Middle East, however, echoed very differently in the context of solidarity in the decolonizing world, revealing its own registers of art appreciation, as it were. One marked heavily by dialogues of solidarity and resonance. Speaking to the artist in Beirut, the American art critic Karen Lewis writes, for instance, you can see uh, pages from the review, that's the famine work, that's the, the, the Jordan works, and these are some other works he, were doing, he was doing in the 50s. Uh, Lewis writes, and I quote, a recurring theme of the Pakistani artist Zainul Abedin in an aband is the abandoned people and their isolation. What more suitable theme for the artist who became world renowned for his pictures of the Bengal famine of 43 than that of the displaced people, the Palestinian refugees, close quote. Lewis writes, and I quote again, Abedin's sweeping black lines of a group of commandos rushing into unknown dangers certainly won't let anyone rest in their, with their own problems, nor will his pen and wash sketches of refugees from Sinai on the move with all their belongings on their backs leave the conscience be. Abedin prefers to do his sketches and paintings in stark black and gray washes because of the poignancy of his subjects and the suitability of those colors to it. So there is a, there is a strong hint of a formal argument around uh, drawing of refugees and what kind of formal demands it places on the artist. Speaking to Lewis, Abedin notes, and I quote, there is a great deal of sympathy in Pakistan for the Palestinian cause. They are our brethren and my tour is to let the rest of the world know the dimensions of the Palestinian tragedy through my art. The Palestinian tragedy is not well projected in Europe and the rest of the world. Pakistan, he continues, had a problem with refugees but much higher. After the partition of India into Pakistan, uh, of, into Pakistan and India in 1947, the inhumanity of the situation captured in the pictures cry out about the injustice, and they have a much more universal appeal uh, to someone living, say, in the United States or England. You know, each person is so involved in his own problems that the seriousness of other problems half a world away is often lost on them. Yet, he continues, sorrow and happiness are the same all over the world, and a viewer can sympathize with this much better than he can do to a news report. In my remaining time, I would like to dwell on this note, an affirmation of universality in Abedin's statement. There is a wider conversation to be had, I think, between the question of the universal and the particular and its resonances, aesthetic, archival, historiographical, theoretical, for the question of the transnational or the transregional. This is both to loosen the grip of the national in formulating what post-colonial modernism is and also tied to that, how we should think, write, curate, or uh, uh, teach it, and to deaccelerate at the same time the velocity of the global, as it were, as we try to decenter for justified reasons Euro-American epistemes. What are the epistemes coming from the decolonizing world in art, in aesthetic criticism, and art histories? Among the different possibilities to this question, my own interest lies in the question of freedom, in its plural vocabularies, or more recently in this material, the question of liberation. The year 1970, when Abedin travels to the front lines of the Palestinian struggle, marks a critical juncture in this question of liberation in Abedin's own works. While the reports from Beirut, like Karen Lewis's text here and the express text that we saw earlier, show that exhibitions of Abedin's works were going to be organized in most of the Arab, in many of the Arab capitals in 1971, with him due to visit the Middle East again, to be personally present in these exhibitions, this does not happen. The works are lost. So this is a letter uh, from uh, Jahana Abedin, his wife, to, um, to people in Cairo actually saying what happened to these images. He left some images in Cairo, he was supposed to go back, he couldn't. Where are the images? And uh, this conversation goes back and forth. Uh, nothing really happens. This loss of the images in 1970-71 is also marked by the critical rupture of 7071, when East Pakistan itself fought for its own liberation from an undivided Pakistan, becoming Bangladesh in 1971. This birth of Bangladesh, less than a year after Abedin made his Jordan drawings, not only upended the artist's plans to return to Lebanon, to Syria, to Jordan, but also and Cairo, but also snapped links of communication around these drawings made in solidarity with Arab liberation movements. Right after returning from uh, Cairo, Abedin is 
taken over by two critical ruptures. One is that of nature. There is a tremendous tidal flood that affects Bangladesh in the November of 1970. Uh, the region is the Monpura region, which would eventually become quite integral to how Abidin is remembered. And the second is the country's own liberation war, accelerating through the late 1970 and early 1971 where his own life, the life of his comrades, his countrymen, his fellow artists, educators and intellectuals were under attack. Many were decimated by the Pakistani army in course of the liberation war. One of the main weapons, apart from rape, was uh, eliminating the memory of the nation as it were. So intellectuals were killed, students were killed, professors were killed. So uh, that was one of the quite um, iconic uh, mechanisms of the civil war and the liberation war in Bangladesh. This generates an acceleration in over 1970-71 that overtakes Abedin and, it is, uh, and his Arab journey, even the potential journeys that didn't happen, those journeys are also kind of curtailed and reconfigured. So liberation disrupts uh, solidarity also. That is what I'm trying to get at. Looking at Abedin's works between 1970 and 71, we land into an overlapping visual vocabulary between Palestinian drawings and what he would do upon return. And I just want to, um, some of this is, uh, uh, so th that's a page of a notebook, Abedin's sketchbook. It is the same sketchbook in which he did some of his uh, Cairo sketches and some of the, you know, the, the Jordan uh, sketches. Um, and, and I just want to tell you what it says. So he, he's describing things that are tied to the region of the flood. So initially I thought these are, this is his Manpura uh, sketchbook, but it's not, it's the same sketchbook. And then in Bengali it says, uh, those who are alive, those who are dead, those who are dying, those who are alive but dead, what shall we do? Uh, we have lost humanity. Huh? So there are this, and this is important because Abedin goes to the front lines of the famine, if one can, not famine, the flood, but he doesn't make the scroll immediately. So it is possible he took down notes and he chewed on it and then after a year or so, he sat at one go in one afternoon and finished this. And this is a gigantic scroll. So this is, uh, it's called the Monpura scroll and you have uh, this decimation and devastation caused by, uh, you know, a natural disaster, uh, very reminiscent of his famine works, but instead of emaciated body, you have plumped up bodies that have been floating in water, basically submerged. So there is a strange corporeality that echoes death, but brings in a different iconography of death tied to different kinds of displacement. And this image is tied, is from the Palestinian, uh, this is his Palestinian work. Uh, but when I started looking at the set of material, I was confused between is this a part of his Monpura drawings or is it a part of, uh, you know, the, the Palestinian work. And that confusion, uh, not that I'm trying to be dodgy, but that confusion I feel is productive. When the diary is overlapping, the iconography is overlap overlapping, and these are two different movements of liberation we are talking about that are also truncated. So how do we think about solidarity that is truncated and solidarity that bleeds into uh -huh, a narration within the scope of an archival document, let's say, if I'm being able to um, articulate it properly. If we zoom out, we see um, also, uh, yeah, that was, the, uh, that was the, the, the Monpura drawings, and this is his drawings from 1971, his Liberation War series. So you have, again, the figure, uh, again, this kind of cluster of chaotic lines that we saw in his Jordan drawings, and he, there in Bengali, it says 1952, can we ever forget? 1952 is the year of the language movement in, uh, um, in, in uh, East Pakistan, the reason why 21st February is declared by the UNESCO as Mother, Mother Tongue Day. Uh, they fought for the language, uh, the, the independence of Bengali from Urdu in Pakistan, and that was one of the main reasons why uh, discontent swelled into eventually the liberation war. And these are his uh, liberation war guerrilla, uh, guerrilla fighter students. These are often students, uh, peasants, in Zainul Abedin, 1971. And there is a way in which the velocity of the Palestinian drawings and the liberation war drawings, they sit together, yet they are, they are two completely different sets of works. And I'm maybe trying to come up with a question that connects both outside the most palpable answer of solidarity, right? How do I write about solidarity 
beyond showing it. If we zoom out, we see a similar visual vocabulary along the frontiers of decolonization and liberation war, Vietnam and Palestine in the 1970s, and this is from the Journal of Afro-Asian uh, Writing, Lotus, something that I have been working on. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how to bring these things together. On the pages of Lotus in the early 70s, for instance, you had a footage, footage from uh, on the Vietnamese war, war front by artists like uh, Hyung Phong Dong, my pronunciation is bad, but he's one of the artists who's dwelling with the guerrilla fighter to wrap up. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, similar uh, Ishmael Shamuth, uh, et cetera, so uh, artists who are working in the Palestinian camps. There is a growing body uh, of, um, you know, figuration of the guerrilla fighter, an iconic use of the figure of the guerrilla fighter that would then flash in and out of poems of solidarity. In this body, and I'll wrap up, in this body of visual imagery of art and partisan war fronts in the shadow of decolonization, um, is this body of uh, visual imagery of art and partisan war fronts in the shadow of decolonization and entangled with the long durée politics of colonialism and its aftermath, are these party particular histories or are these more general universal histories? Is this potentially a new, even alternative universalism that can counter ways in which Cold War binaries between the concrete and the abstract have been drawn? I will propose that perhaps it is through the ingredients, the lineages of the solidarity that we see in Abedin's art, that lineage can be one of famine, one of communist party associations, uh, huh? the way the 40s and the 70s speak to each other, for instance. Um, it, is, it, it is through these lineages, delineating these lineages, that we can probably see a coexistence, a dialogue, even a dialectic between the particular and the universal that operates in the work of an artist who genuinely wants to grapple with both. Thinking alongside Abedin, I want to close with what M. Césaire wrote to the French Communist Party in 1956. And I quote, I'm against burying myself in a narrow particularism but neither do I want to lose myself in an emaciated universalism. There are two ways to lose oneself, walled segregation in the particular or dilution in the universal. My conception of the universal is that of a universal enriched by all that is particular, a universal enriched by every particular, the deepening and the coexistence of all particulars. And we'll wrap up here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Muhana, yes. <laughs> do you have uh, you have wow. your things? Okay. So you have the floor. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, okay. We have sound now. Sound. Can we have the screen? Uh, ah, not yet. Oh, because it's not connected. Ah, okay, okay, I found it. I found it. Sorry, thank you. You have a signal now? All right, um, so good afternoon, everyone, and um, thanks a lot for this uh, very interesting uh, talks and conference, uh, conference and uh, all this discussion uh, and presentation, presentations. Uh, mm. So uh, I'm working more, uh, my research is more about uh, 
finding a pedagogy out of a method our methodology a pedagogy out of archival practices and uh, really the research i'm working on it's called imperfect archive which is departing from um, julio spinoza's uh, like amazing text uh, about uh, toward imperfect cinema so the hypothesis is um, for imperfect uh, cinema I mean, imperfect cinemas can't be reserved unless it is in imperfect archives. And uh, while looking at the text of uh, Spinoza about what is imperfect cinema, it's basically the cinema that is made by people. Uh, cinema that is not looking for perfection, actually is more looking for the fractures and um, problems. Uh, not trying to create or depict uh, a perfection of reality rather than looking at the problems of reality. Uh, the same way, uh, looking at the same same pedagogy or the same way of thinking, looking at the, um, the archives in this way, and I thought of it as like uh, the archives that has been saved uh, or been at indivi by individuals, like collective archives of different struggles, and mainly we find these uh, archives by uh, in solidarity groups who were active in the 60s, 70s, and they. Uh, they stop being active uh, or they with the whole different uh, changes in the political or social economical atmospheres around the world so we've been stumbling uh, around these um, archives all around the world and it's just try to make a kind of a sense out of these uh, archives and how to activate them uh, today in an imperfect way so of course when we are talking about imperfect archives we are comparing them for what we call the perfect archives, which is the institute archives that is trying or, tr or uh, presenting uh, history, or as they say, they protect the narratives. So uh, the actually the imperfect archives, like imperfect cinemas, they're not busy uh, with proving points as much as uh, progressing with the realities. So imperfect archives uh, also can be lost, uh, can be added, can be edited. Uh, these are related to the people who are saving them and uh, progressing with them uh, day by day. The story actually begins uh, in 2017. I was screening uh, the film I made about the history of Palestinian militant cinema. It's called Ofrem, AKA Revolution Until Victory. And uh, the film uh, was, was screened in uh, Tokyo. And after the screening, uh, someone came to me and uh, she told me about a collection she has in her family house. Uh, I, I didn't have a lot of time to check what is it, but she gave me this uh, inventory or like kind of an index, which from the first sight, when I look at it, I mean, I'm a person or some, I've, I've been part of a group, subversive film that has been working for 10 years looking for Palestinian militant cinema and militant uh, uh, production. And uh, out of these titles, I only knew three or four. And it was a problem because I just finished a film about the history of militant cinema and there's like actually 70% of these films that I don't even know, which really intrigued me a lot. Uh, so I decided like to try to get the, the films. I went uh, after that by one year I was working with, uh, with Rasha Salti and Christine Khoury on their uh, production of, uh, of their book uh, and the research uh, Past Disquiet, which also related to uh, uh, a Japanese artist group that was called JALA and they are still actually active and they are inter a transnational artist group who participated part of it in that uh, exhibition in Beirut and that exhibition in, uh, that happened in Madrid about uh, in solidarity with uh, Chile and other kinds of exhibition. But uh, with this film collective, we didn't know, collection, we didn't know what to do. So we went to the place. Uh, the first thing we went in, it was like a, a house outside of Tokyo. It was like an hour and a half by train. Uh, we reached there. It's a traditional Japanese house. And there was a room, a small room that actually when we opened it, it's the room of Tanami-san, who's a professor of uh, literature, uh, Middle Eastern literature in Horishima University. 
and uh, she was actually an active an activist in the 80s uh, with the Palestine Committee or the, the Palestine Solidarity Movement in Japan. And uh, when I asked about the story, what happened really, uh, she, she doesn't really know because she joined the group uh, quite late, like around 87. And in 88, the, the embassy, the PLO, not the embassy, the PLO representative office, uh, where these material were held, closed because of financial problems. Uh, the, uh, a Lutheran church that was in the neighborhood uh, uh, accepted to host these material for two, three years, but in two, three years, around 1991, they couldn't, uh, they needed the space, the storage space, so Tanami-san uh, was already finishing her studies. She got a master's in another city, so she decided, like she said, she told the activist group, she, did, she only knew one of them very closely, and she offered her room. Of course, her parents were not happy. I mean, they were so happy to see us uh, in 2018, uh, and they were expecting us to take everything. But when we uh, entered in, we kind of found a whole library. I mean, a whole collection of texts and books about the Palestinian uh, revolution and the Middle East struggle uh, in Japanese. And we even with these, like there was some, someone we still don't know who he is, has been like carefully collecting, making cutouts of all of the magazines and newspaper about Palestinian uh, question and Palestinian struggle and putting them all together. But we decided not to open this at this stage and we move on. We also found a big collection of uh, transnational posters uh, in this collection. This is a poster from the anti-fascist, uh, anti-fascist uh, Franco uh, movement, uh, the FRAP, of course, uh, these are the last five people uh, mainly killed by the Franco regime in 75. This is one of the reels we, uh, we found there. Other posters, of course, th this is the, the conference the, the union, the youth movement, the left, le left uh, youth movement conference, uh, one of the posters. Again, it's another uh, letter for Smail Shammut. Uh, of, of course, Smail Shammut was one of these figures that he's a very famous painter and artist, but also was a very uh, polit political figure at the same time. He was the head of the plastic art section in the PLO. So, of course, there was a lot of uh, correspondence happening with different representation offices. Uh, but then when we asked uh, more closely, it's, um, the collection is really not the PLO collection, it's the collection of the, the activist group who was collaborating with the PLO office and really helped uh, to open the representation office in Tokyo. We will get that at the end uh, to that point. Also another poster uh, from the anti-apartheid movement uh, we found like lots of posters, but then th these were the, the films uh, we found which uh, there were 20 reels uh, of films which the, the index we saw at the beginning contained them. Uh, funnily enough, we managed to pack them, uh, put them in a bag, me with my long beard at that time and just flow from Japan to Brussels with no any authorization and uh, nothing. It was just like just jumping on the plane and I was really surprised, okay, I passed the Japanese borders, but then I was sure that I will be held by the uh, Belgian custom. But obviously ki this kind of history maybe didn't intrigue any, uh, any alarm for them. So they let me pass. This is in my office in, uh, in Brussels. When we got that, uh, when we got these and I took them to my uh, studio, we started to think about, so what are we gonna do with this? I mean, is it gonna be, uh, where do we start uh, looking at this material? And it was more about, for me, I'm, I'm originally a mechanical engineer, so for me, materiality, it's very important. I get a lot of my information from the, 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 the substance, the, the, what is written and the, the feeling and the texture. And I kind of uh, withdraw or like uh, take my knowledge, uh, at least my first instant knowledge, I take it from the material. So I decided to make like a kind of a forensic uh, investigation first in the material before going into what is inside it. So we, uh, we 
did like this whole photography of everything, like the, the image is not so great here, but on my computer looks much nicer. Uh, I mean, there is like lots of details in the middle as well, but we opened each one like that, then we opening the negative, opening the, the canister or the box, uh, doing uh, detailed photography of everything uh, in the collection. Also, what has been uh, the type of the negative, uh, what is written on the negative. And we did that with uh, everything. And we added labels. We started to add labels to the collection. And we did that with the 20 films. The whole idea as well was, what are we talking about here? We have like a, a, a nation, a struggle that is today claiming that their archive is lost. So what do we do? Do we still keep looking for an archive or we start building archive from what we have? And that's actually what we, uh, the idea of making this expanded inventory uh, is the idea of uh, building an archive because it's kind of a, a people who can't produce archive, they're actually defeated. And this idea and the, the idea of being victorious or thinking of this notion of why the Palestinian revolution and other revolutions use this until victory. So it's always in this anticipation of, of a moment of victory where you're going to put your archive in. And it's about the, the, like if you are living in a house, for example, and you have your own library, you will always be adding material to it. And maybe some books will be lost from there and some images will be added and you have the right to write on these uh, books or these artifacts that is in this archive. And this is the way we actually dealt with this kind of material that we uh, have, we kind of uh, took it in and we add we wanted to add this kind of images to the archive. So when we give it back to Japan, we also give it back with uh, a kind of a, a form around it, not only the material. So we kept going on with all of the information from the back, from the front, and then we did translation. So that's at the end, not at the end, like once we finished this uh, forensic uh, investigation, we, had, uh, we started to have a pattern in, in somehow. And that was the whole point. Because when I spoke, I mean, the Japanese uh, movement, uh, solidarity movement, they don't want really to show in the front because for them the struggle is still going on. And it's really, um, it's not archives. These are not archives. These are part of, uh, of knowledge of people in struggle. And this kind of networks are still for them active. So which left us uh, with a situation that we are there here to reimagine what kind of uh, group or politics these gr this, this, this activist group were, uh, were there. And that, that, that we, we decided, um, when I say we, we are talking about Subversive Film, uh, which is the, the collective that I work with. So we decided that we're going to imagine uh, this group and the history of that group and create their account by looking at their uh, curation and by looking at what they left uh, of traces on these material. Uh, of course, once you also put all of them together, they started to have like certain patterns. There are numbering uh, that is like happening in several times and it seems that someone was also doing the for the projection and somebody was actually curating them. For, uh, for certain screenings. What was in that screening? Also here, we started to find like these are things which we still kind of trying to imagine. What are they? After we did this uh, process of uh, trying to find patterns and putting all of this information in, th in a kind of an Excel sheet, like a, a metadata information and somehow, uh, that's the stage when we started going for the scanner and scanning what is in the material. Uh, yeah, here also is the collection itself, but then we, I don't know why, but we started to add our own labeling uh, to this material. So as, uh, as this uh, uh, activist group were also labeling these uh, films, we also started to label them, adding another layer uh, to the material. And that's when this inventory we saw at the beginning became this. So instead of having it like uh, 
this, so which really there was lots, lots of information that is missing. Also, it's something, it's a characteristic of militant cinema in general, but also Palestinian militant cinema, that a film, uh, for example, in Arabic has a title, when it goes to French, has a different title, when it goes to German, has a different, and in Japanese, so which kind of creates a big, of, uh, a, a, a big confusion but also it's, uh, it's also related to the concept of distribution or militant distribution that is not about the authenticity of the film, but it's more about the distribution and the dissemination of this kind of material. So we, uh, what we did, we also, we kept kind of a fair uh, translation for, uh, for what is this material but then we, uh, we, we, we compared what we know from the knowledge and actually still out of the, uh, we know that 50 or 60% we knew about them. There was still like eight films that we never heard of them uh, and they were in this Japanese uh, collection. And then once we start also organizing them in terms of year of production, uh, also the, the production who was producing it, it gave us also much more uh, understanding. Uh, first of all, like th these films didn't came at once, for example. They came at certain times. And there are th these times are related when you compare them to the political uh, timeline, they also reflect some stuff. So for example, in uh, 60, 67, 68, there is three or four films. There is a 74 after Arafat uh, speech in the UN and district international recognition also, there was another four or five films. There is another film that, ha another group of films that came on 78, which was also related to the invasion of south of Lebanon and the Lebanese civil war. And the last, the last evidence of film that been added to this collection was 82, which kind of make the, the timeline correct and somehow from 68 till 82, which was the Palestinian revolution as we kind of consider it. But also the, the productions of, of these films uh, varied from at the beginning, at the first two, three, four years, it was kind of honor war films, which is images of refugees that were uh, presented in several kinds of uh, formats. Then there was the, the Palestine Film Unit, the Palestine Film Institute, films that start to come in into the group, into the collection, uh, which is more of a self-representation films. There are films that are made by Arab and international filmmakers, but mainly commissioned, whether by the Iraqi Film Institute or the Syrian Film Institute. Some is like the, uh, the American piece, uh, for example, United States Productions. And there are three or four films that were uh, Japanese, Japanese production. And it was interesting also to see what was happening. So for example, this film called Beyond, Beyond the War, which it's a very uh, honor, it's an honor war film, a very famous film. Uh, and what we know it, it's called Aftermath. It's uh, the film, uh, it's like the f th that kind of honor war production about refugees. Uh, it was kind of screened in such halls for dinners, uh, like for, for fundraising around refugees, whether in Vienna or in uh, New York or in uh, Tokyo as well. And it seems that they were asked uh, this Awanami production, uh, which is a Japanese publishing house, which they were mainly doing educational material uh, from the 50s, they made the film. But what is interesting as well, that the original film uh, is 38 minutes and the Japanese version was 28 minutes. So, and also there we started to do another research and we realized that actually what they did, they removed all of the male interviews and kept the female interviews which made the film, totally altered the film, made it about the woman role in, uh, in sustaining uh, uh, life when the refugee camps and their role actually in revolution. Uh, and actually there was also some alternation in the translation, in the voiceover, so the English voiceover, and somehow very slightly, but it's a v this kind of subversive work. And then we discovered much more material about this Awanami production. Another thing, once we started to uh, scan uh, the films, before going to the material, you know, when you are scanning the 16 millimeter or 35 uh, projectionist and production houses used to write their notes uh, on the negatives. 
uh, directly or in the positives directly. And that also was another uh, place to extract information, another place to find much more information about, for example, uh, uh, b beside the technical information that is related to sound and image and color, there was also information about film festivals, uh, information from projectionists. Uh, if you can trace, if it's the same projectionist by tracing, it's the same uh, handwritten on them. Here, of course, the image, it's a bit weird because I can see it here, but here you can see like text, yeah, like here, for example. Uh, you can see how is the, the writing that happens on these uh, materials. Um, also, we found another thing that this Awanami production, uh, it was another film called Blown by the Wind by a film, uh, by a photographer, actually a Second World War photographer, John Madvo. Uh, who was very instrumental or one of the very like great photographers who documented the Palestinian diaspora working with the UNRWA. Uh, and it's the, his only film. I didn't know that even he had a film. But basically he used some of his photographs with some paintings and he made this film. And it seems that Awanami was part of the production because we couldn't find any trace of the film outside of Japan. And this is another kind of research we are starting to, uh, to open. But then we started to look about Awanami, and Awanami is like a huge production house that many of what we call the new Japanese wave, documentary wave, actually worked there in the 50s and the 60s, Nunukawa, uh, Ogawa. Uh, and there was so big that there was also political factions within the production company. So this group was one group that until today we don't know the names of this group was called, they called themselves the Blue Colors. And they were the main people who were alternating uh, like films that comes from third world uh, context uh, to make them more subversive for the Japanese audience in somehow. Of course, we still continue with this material here and there. Uh, a lot of information again comes out uh, from this material, like one of the films that we doesn't have even credit but on the, the, what is written in the negative, we could understand and know who's the, the, the production or the people who are behind this uh, material. Uh, we started to, all of the text that is being on the material itself that we started to translate to make a sense. And in one of them, we actually found that it's, uh, it's a note for, uh, for a lecture. So uh, this, these films or one or two of these films to be screened within a certain uh, context and what is the topic that they've been talking at, which also tells us a lot about what is the political attitude uh, of this um, solidarity movement. So here, for example, at the end, they're saying, at the end of our first session, we would like to deepen the discussion about the way of our movement by looking at the actual situation of Japan, Korea expanding into the Middle East and in so doing, reveal the anti-social aspect of the so-called Japan national interest. And here also, it tells very much that how they are looking actually at the Palestinian question as a way to make a dialogue into the Japanese politics. Rather than, I mean, it's, it's so interesting when you look at these films, if you look at them one by one of these films, you are looking at Palestinian cinema. But once you put them all together, you start to see a dialogue within the, the Japanese uh, left movement. And this contra co contrast between the, the more radical and the more middle like uh, left, which also played much more bigger role uh, with Fatih. Because what we know mainly uh, here in the West, uh, this international uh, uh, red Japanese army, uh, especially their operation in Lid, and of course, there's been a lot of work on that and with the PFLP, but we really don't know what is the relationship with Fatah and who were the rivals in the Japanese politics and what were their op uh, opposition. Of course, when you speak with them in Japan, we spent some time there and we were speaking with them. I mean, many of them kind of hate the, the international faction because they, they brought down, the, they, they gave a chance for the government to crack on the left movement in Japan in many ways, so, but I will, I will speak about this when I uh, finish about how that played with their politics as well. So with gathering all of these information, uh, how long, how long? Five minutes already, but. Oh, really? Yes. 
I mean, yesterday I had like three hour uh, lecture in PATH only on <laughs> this, so I'm gonna try to. <laughs> so it's just, I'm gonna go through it very quickly, sorry. It's just, uh, it's an, I'm an artist, so. <laughs> so here basically we collected all of this information and we decided to make um, a catalog for every film, like a kind of a press kit that collect all of these information in one place, which is like a place where you have uh, the synopsis written in English, uh, Arabic, and Japanese, with all also the, the, the credits uh, of every film. And somehow it's also, uh, we are still building onto the, uh, the archive itself. Of course, we also did a transcript for all of the voiceovers and the script that are in the films in, in different languages. Uh, also provided all of these information. So it will be kind of a, a press kit in, in somehow. Uh, but I will go to this. At the end, the whole thing should look like this. So these are 20 catalogs for the 20 reels. And each one, of course, is, uh, is by its own a segment. It's you, we, we know about the film and we have all full information about each film. But when we look at it uh, as, as a whole, we also kind of have a, a, a bigger reading for, uh, for that movement uh, on international movement. Um, okay, maybe I, I just want to really show you the one of the qualities of, of, uh, of these maybe three minutes extra. Uh, because this is also interesting that the m we found one, f one film, uh, which is the key film to understand this collection. It's called the Palestine to Japan, and it's actually made by this group who are collecting this uh, material. But funnily enough that this film actually is w the film that was in the worst shape, that you really can't screen as a film. You only can deal with it as a research material. Um, and I will put here uh, the, um, that interview with Chairman Arafat because it also tells a lot about that politics. So maybe I will play just the first three mini two minutes of this and then we go to Chairman Arafat. And of course, like this is another thing when we are dealing with the institutional archives that we always never get the chance to access the metadata. We are always given the final product, which is the film that has been restored. And, uh, but it also eliminates a lot of the effect of the time that happens and there's a lot of information, as I said, at the beginning and the end of the film, like you're seeing here. Japan is a remote country in the northeastern Asia, located far, far away on the other side of the earth. When the burning sun shines in Palestine, it is time now for the Japanese people to greet the coming of early spring, having passed through one of the severest winters in these years. Palestinian children and Japanese children engaged in playing under the early spring sun. Uh, I'll go to... Okay, uh, just two minutes. Chairman Arafat stressed the importance of strengthening mutual relations between Palestinian and Japanese peoples. We are very interesting to have a good relation with the Japanese people because we are uh, we admire the way how Japan and the Japanese people have the ability to stand firmly against the uh, uh, the American. Colonialism. 
start at the second order. And uh, your miracle, your uh, uh, economic miracle. We admire it very much. It is an ideal uh, example for our people. So we are looking to strengthen the links between the Justinian people and the Japanese people. Uh, we the Palestinian people, in spite we are, we have this uh, very fierce uh, tragedy. We have the highest educated percentage in this area, including Israelis. You know that? This fact? For this we are admiring your struggle after the second order. And uh, we are eager to uh, have more and more links between the Palestinian people and the Japanese people. And we are sure that we will succeed because we have a lot of friends. I know a lot of them among your people, your friendly people. Because we can say that, that the Japanese people are very near to our case and are supporting our uh, revolution and our case, our justice case. We know that uh, your, your government uh, is not looking exactly as we are looking, but we hope, now we know the reason. It is the American influence. If we put this uh, in the context of uh, geopolitics of what that time was happening, we can't uh, omit the fact of the oil embargo by the Arab uh, countries in 73, and how did the American at that moment also betrayed their Japanese allies and they took the reserve of oil for them, which left the Japanese economy in a very hard position. Uh, the Japanese left, uh, that, that, that uh, um, centrist Japanese left offered the solution by that the entering to the Arab hearts is by going into the Palestinian question. And that's where the office was opened. And actually the Palestinian uh, movement at that moment became, uh, or like the Palestinian embassy became the center of uh, big uh, business adventure for the Arab world. And the, the office was actually in between uh, like Iraqi, Algerian, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, offices. Um, and it's actually, it kind of reflected me because I grew up in Kuwait and it was a lot of this anima, uh, Japanese, and but also a lot of the Japanese technology in the 80s, national and all of this kind of technology, VHS was coming in. And it's all related in, in somehow to, to this Palestinian uh, politics and this group that was kind of pushing for that. They still didn't reveal themselves, and I don't think that they will reveal them themselves, but it's really interesting to build this kind of narratives and accounts around oblivion. Uh, I will end by uh, quoting uh, this famous Soviet uh, sentence that while the future is uh, certain, uh, past is yet unpredictable. Thanks a lot. So, uh, yes. So, I, we will have right now a moment to have a discussion with all the participants. I would say no more than 15 minutes because we are <laughs> on a tight schedule, but anyway, it, it, I think we, we can continue over the, the pause. So, um, Should I, stay here? I don't know, any, any reactions and questions just right away on, on, the, on the panel that we want yes. to... And Mariano, we can get Mariano back, sorry. Uh, Mariano is there. Okay, Mariano, <laughs> we are with moments of questions and comments. And, uh, yes, there is someone there. 
Oh, should I shall I <laughs> maybe Hello? Like this? Do you understand me? Yes. Uh, a couple of commentaries and also questions. Uh, so thank you for this very interesting panel. Uh, also, according to yesterday, I found it very interesting because in the, in the first talk, you know, there was, for example, with the proletarian calendar, you know, just like several examples. Also, if we refer to Vijay's comment yesterday, to reinvent, you know, uh, kind of other history or re white right history, I found it very interesting as an example. Uh, also, uh, then in connection with the talk to Mariano, no, who brought the example also with uh, within the film, no, I Damnati de la Terra, within the section of the labyrinth of violence, and then this intersection, intersection. Now it is it is up to us. It's exactly uh, what we were referring to, or what was referred to yesterday, which I found really really interesting. Uh, I have a question for Sanjukta, uh, because you were referring to the invitation uh, of Abadin and you referred to the bar pa bath party. So uh, I find it really interesting if we're talking about uh, this time frame, the late 60s, the 70s. So we have kind of international organization trends, let's say, or a super political, but also involved with political issues like the tricontinental. But we have also kind of frameworks, networks, you know, just like uh, referring to a lot of parties. So you were referring to this kind of socialist connection when you refer to Spain, for example, you have in the 60s a lot, the commun or also in the 50s, the Communist Party uh, also as an example. Uh, so I, I think there is a common uh, kind of topic uh, also with, with, with other talks that we just have had, maybe Paolo, maybe you both can comment on this. And the last thing, uh, by, uh, the talk by Mohanad, uh, I found it really interesting. You must have been frightened, you know, to see uh, these images that Jihan showed before of the archive, you know, just like uh, the, the archive where you find a pile of films, you know, just like, and how kind of this, this memory is treated. And then uh, just like in comparison, uh, I, I see you labeling, you know, just like, and like an archeologist, you know, just like uh, tr trying to, 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 to recreate the archive or recreate an archive, you know, just like also if you could comment on this. Okay, thank you. I would say as we are tight on time, we can gather some comments and then there will be a moment for answer, no? Maybe mm -hmm. better. I have one question. I'm interested in form, artistic form, and this is probably more uh, directed to Sanjukta and Mariano. Um, one observation I made, um, um, form as in connection to post-war modernism, and is there a possibility to look um, or to view form uh, in relation to Abedin or the film that Mariano presented that, um, I mean, form in Abedin's case, um, you mentioned that, um, m m what's the larger work's name again? Moon for us. Yeah, and you yeah. said, you made, you made a comment that you saw in work that he did in, uh, in Jordan, uh, the Palestine work, that you saw form connected to that. So is that privileged position from which Abedin obviously is uh, drawing or speaking because he's a, he's a bureaucrat, he's traveling, right? He has this opportunity to travel, but he's bringing back something to localize it, right? Mm -hmm. And in uh, Mariano's case, I was struck by form in two or three images that you showed in the film, um, the figures, so um, th those dancing figures, or, or not dancing, but you know, these three, four stretched out bodies. And I was seeing something like it's very, uh, I dare say, very Italian, very classical. So um, I don't know if it's a real question. It's, 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 yeah. I'm an art historian, so I always look at form. I'm wondering if there is um, form, um, if that is an opposition to. Um, modernist, postmodernist, um, or if there is actually a globalized form of modernism, post-war modernism in those kind of works.
thank you uh, for all for presentation presentations. Uh, also, one question for Sanjukta or comment. I don't know. You know, I'm kind of trying to ponder around the question, like uh, <laughs> the did you a few years ago also brought up what makes us rise, a kind of the soulevement uprising, right? And it struck me quite um, strongly, not just like what was now mentioned, uh, like certain kind of conflation or what you were saying, you don't know whether that was from, uh, you know, Jordan or there, but also, you know, this kind of probably two most intense expressions also of emotions, but like what makes you rise up in, in a different way. So like famine and flood on one side and on the other side, liberation, mm -hmm. struggle, going to arms. So like kind of both of course makes the beholder, but uh, yeah, I was wondering if he himself exhibited uh, at some point uh, those paintings or drawings together or it was more like kind of your um, now interpretation to bring them together. So that's maybe the 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 Monpura the J J Jordanian and yes yeah, yeah yeah. So that's like a bit of yeah. ex uh, question for clarification. And then uh, for uh, Mariano, um, of course, um, just like very stupid question from my side because the um, the title of the film right like kind of damne um, or kind of the wretched of the earth if you also translate it like a title of Franz Fanon's uh, famous book from 61 or then translated in 63 I think in English uh, I am sure that they were uh, quite um, you know acknowledged it or but I'm wondering if there are some kind of also quotes or some kind of, you know, um, like kind of strong encounter. I find this um, quote that you also brought up super important, criticism of social reality and rupture of language, of film language or all also language. And I find this, what you showed also kind of, you know, representation of horrors of prison torture or kind of this labyrinth of violence is certain attempt, which is of course maybe on the first side, kind of on the fur on the thin line between certain aesthetization of violence and kind of grappling with what can we do or how you you know kind of look into and confront like what the film ends with this interpolative you know sign okay now or Brichtian you know this now let's look out of this filmic representation. So that's uh, maybe one, maybe for Paula, just something very short. Uh, you did uh, this really amazing uh, panoramic view of very different, you know, struggles, depictions, iconographies. You have like this kind of men, women, uh, and also children as agents of change and struggles. I was wondering if you also thought of um, a kind of uh, certain device of differentiation between, let's say, a more, and I'm not saying it in pejorative or bad terms, like I don't think propaganda is bad or something, but there is like this kind of more instrumentalized kind of use of art as weapons in struggle, and then like maybe certain you know, attempts that break with form, you know, how the struggle is represented and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that of course can be maybe traced in some of the examples, but yeah. And on the, this just very last, uh, very fascinating footage this that you brought up, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite uh, impressive to see this kind of documentary style that is on one side warm and very kind of welcoming, but also a little bit ironic. I don't know, How, I don't know, just like I want to hear a little bit your opinion um, on that because you are more familiar with material. I would say that if we want to be more or less on time, I'm sorry, let's have a, a run of answers and then we can continue on the, um, 
and a good soldier. They told me 15 minutes, so we will do with 15 minutes. So please, maybe who wants to start to answer in a synthetic way, I think. <laughs> I can jump Good in. Everybody's go, go. looking at me. Yeah, yes. Just very quickly, I'll address the three points, the role of political parties, for sure. Uh, so in, um, in, in six, 67, uh, you know, they were representatives of the Awami League in Bangladesh, the, their leader, Maulana Pashani, who's a religious leader, but also a socialist figure who visits um, yeah, Habana. And General Abedin is in close dialogue with, um, with, with this leader. Uh, draws him, um, so Avedin's relation to the socialist wing of the Awami League is very, um, very concrete. Uh, 69 is also a period of extreme uh, student movement and agitation. Uh, Abedin is very much at the center of that. So there is a way in which he moves in and out of the political space and the space of the classroom and the space of the exhibition. So he's one of those figures. So yes, absolutely, political parties have a, I would say a connected, parallel, yet independent trajectory here. Uh, to Simona's point about uh, form, I cannot say if it's a privileged position because the confusion was mine. In the collection, there is no confusion. The Bangladesh National Museum knows that this is an image tied to the Palestinian uh, movement. The confusion is mine and I find it worthwhile because it almost seems like a sketch he would have done for uh, Monpura. Um, I would not say that he's trying to localize an image that he did because in his case, it actually starts in the 40s. So I'm interested more in the long durée kind of resonances uh, of these uh, haunting, I would say, in his case. He's obsessed with the famine imagery. So much so his students do not like how much obsessed because he's moving towards realism and his students don't like it. They want more abstraction. So there is a way in which this artist is haunted even through his travels by the 40s. So the form question I would have is how certain styles keep haunting the work of an artist. What are artists obsessed with? Uh, that's something. So obsession is something I'm interested in looking at aesthetics and decolonization. Um, do post-war modernisms have a globalized form? I think it de that's an answer, answer we have to develop through our research. I would like to say yes, but we need matter for that and more dialogue really like these. Um, the intensity question is very strong. Yeah, I mean, Abedin talks about, I could go on about this because there's something I'm thinking about. Um, these images were uh, exhibited together. Abedin is the figure. Huh? Everybody talks about him in Bangladesh. So his works, whatever he does, are constantly exhibited. Not only that, people who come to see these works write on them. They sign. So it is a collective production because he is a pedagogue huh? par excellence, uh, as it were. So it's very much, so it is possible that the Palestinian works and uh, uh, Monpura would be exhibited together. Uh, and, uh, Bangladesh is a new country, so the question of liberation is very, very strong. It's a raw question, even now. So it's very much tied to that. So intensity, I think, is another way of then thinking about these, you know, this globalized form, uh, whether, whether images tied to decolonization keep getting ha get haunted by the intensity of what is happening or the intensity of particular kinds of inheritance. Um, so I, I do not have an answer, but I think intensity is something to maybe break down, engage with, find vocabularies for when we think of aesthetic form. Uh, thanks for that. That's very helpful. Yes. And maybe Mariano, do you want to answer and then Mariano? Uh, yes, just, yes. Uh, just one question. Um, I think that the, I need to say that the, um, the f this film, Idanati de la Terra, uh, of course, is an homage to Fanon, no? And is influenced by Fanon, uh, Franz Fanon. But um, I would like to say that uh, I show some image of the last part, the last 25 minutes of the films, that, that is this uh, ideological happening uh, that you saw. But the film, uh, uh, the main strategy of the film is the idea of the film within the film. 
So this filmmaker Fausto, who works on the footage that uh, his friend and student uh, leave to him when he died, no, Abramo, no, from Africa. So uh, doing this, they they discuss all a uh, lot of questions, aesthetic questions and political questions about resistant revolution. Because while Fausto see the the materials that that Abramo uh, uh, left to him, uh, uh, leave to him at that moment. He can discuss with 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 uh, her col uh, his col collaborators about how to do this uh, counter visuality, as Mirso says, or uh, this uh, aesthetic of resistance at um, at others. So the question is: I think that this last part. With the uh, with, with the with the bodies and come particularly from the uh, con contemporary theater uh, theater uh, scene uh, and mainly um, uh, especially the living theater that that in Italy had a. a, a a lot of activity at that moment, but also uh, Peter Brook, Peter Weiss, I think, no? Because uh, the, remember that uh, not just Maratzade, of course, but at the same time, remember that this is the moment when, uh, when Peter Weiss uh, did the, the trilogy, como se dice, the three books, uh, about the the theater document, can I say like this in English? The the document, the 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 theater and documents. And one of of those books, do you remember, was about uh, Portuguese colonialism in different countries. Not at that moment. So there are there are a mix of of different uh, influence. And I think it is a, a contamination of 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 and a dialogue with with this question, the question of the of the form and the question of the aestheticization. I think is is so long to to discuss here because, as as you say, uh, you you can think that in 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 some way the you can find this aestheticization, but at, at the same time is is uh, this idea to challenge the viewer and and this use of experimental form but no not uh, in order to to just exp uh, do ex experimental as we can say but uh, in order to as a method to uh, to, to 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 challenge the viewer yeah that that is the idea i I shall say this. Thanks. Thank you, Mariano. And maybe you want to answer uh, uh, and at the end. Horace, I will just answer very quickly about the question. No, I don't feel uh, horrified with the images. I mean, um, an archive can be made from one image. It's just uh, it's one image that you build up a whole thing around it. So and also, we were just discussing this that what is useful for the like the, the colonial of that uh, country, Senegal, which was France, already took what, so if things are, we want to think about it preserved in the Western way, it is preserved in France. But it's, that is not the important question for the Senegalese. It's, uh, it's w what is the need actually of uh, saving this archive or working on it. And I also believe in this concept of the death of the archive as well. I think can we have to allow it to to die. I mean, also that this idea that we don't allow architecture to die or we don't allow an archive to die makes it in a in a zombie state in, in somehow and kind of prevent uh, building or bringing new knowledge uh, on top of that. In terms of uh, iconic uh, about that film, it's actually this film is different because it's the film that is made by the same Japanese group. And it's very interesting because it's a futuristic film. They are actually, this film was made in the first anniversary of opening the PLO office. So it's a kind of a, a, a victory film. 
in many ways. So it's a very futuristic way to look at how would we celebrate an anniversary of something. It's like imagine the Algerian is celebrating the first anniversary of the, the liberation. We, they made very bad films, but it, it, it was their own films. And they, uh, they enjoyed making it. And I can imagine the joy of them making this kind of film and using all of this kitschy uh, music and scenes and stuff like that. But this is the way that they are trying uh, to build up uh, their own image as well, which is totally different than the militant cinema. It doesn't have that propagandish element. It's more was like this film was all celebrating. Also has this Japanese element of looking at the environment, looking at the weather. Uh, you can see that in several time of the film, uh, which is also kind of a nice way of seeing this relationship, solidarity between the Japanese people and the Palestinian people and kind of engaging them with the same language that they see things. So I think it's iconic in that sense because it gives a model of how would we make films, how bad we would make films after liberation. <laughs> but we make films, which is the important thing. No. Yeah, exactly. This is the thing, uh, the, the point of the panel. So just to finish with two answers very quickly, regarding the role of the party, it, it, it was complicated in the case of the Spanish, mm -hmm. uh, in the Spanish case, because uh, finally the, the party was never as advanced as the artists, so it was difficult for them, and most of the practices happened within a liminal space between the party and outside the party, and this was very important and became more and more important after the 1950s and 60s, but because there was this anti-Francoist struggle, the party federated uh, the struggle in somehow, no? So, and so regarding form, well, uh, uh, that you ask, Gal, yes, this was a, a four point that I couldn't do in, in 25 minutes, but what the artists, I mean, the thing is that they wanted to reframe propaganda as an avant-garde uh, tool. And this is, I couldn't go into detail because I wanted to decline the three concepts, you know, of the session, but it's very visible in the, in the, um, the sophisticated uh, visuality of the Spanish Civil War that is using the montage and the photomontage a lot, but also in the, in the three continental it seems propaganda because if you, you look at this uh, f a figure with the uh, Kalashnikov, but they are using like uh, a codification that's completely avant-garde through the mass media, for example. The same with the Chilean and brigades, uh, including the popular and people that they were not trained, but then artists started to go there and to create a kind of dialogue. And so you see that they are not they are represented through the media, the images of this woman, for example, that they show you. So so the idea, and as one art critic said, uh, an anti-Francoist cr uh, uh, critic said in Spain in the 1960s, the idea is how you resignify uh, realism as a form of avant-garde, for example. And this is very important, because when we see figuration, is immediately thought as propaganda. And the last thing I would say, there are strict, uh, in incredible connections, as we saw with the case of Mariano, between uh, avant-gardistic practices as Tucumán Arde and the Third War Exhibition. The media and the way that they use it is really similar. And for example, the bodies that you were talking about of the labyrinth of violence and the, uh, the avant-garde work of Arthur Barrio, you know, regarding violence, uh, you know, uh, in Latin America. So th there, were, there were really interconnections and I think we have to move forward, move out of the, the way how art historians we think um, about uh, pr propaganda because we are not including this kind of practices, mm. you know. Okay, and that's it, and thank you very much. And we can continue during the pause, that is for how many minutes? Okay, so some practical information after thanking you again. Thank you all. Yeah.